l'aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta? sì Giustani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza e tutti colpiti da una curiosità sospendono per un istante d'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido. aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta? sì Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo l'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza sospendono per un istante d'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido. civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. Amici. Hello everybody. This meeting that we have called Giussani 100 to remember the centenary of Don Giussani's birth and as I had the chance to write this morning for the Susidiario news newspaper. We want to give more meaning to this. There are a hundred worlds, a hundred ways, a hundred sparks that Giussani and his figure and his personality and his words lit up in the people that encountered him 
or that directly met him, or those who got to know him through his writings, or through other people, as it happened to many of us. The number 100 summarizes all of these meanings. I always introduce my meetings very with very few words because I know that you're all here to listen to people who have very interesting things to say about Don Giussani. And we thought about, we, th we thought to organize this encounter, this conference, uh, like a sort of virtual exhibition uh, of which you can see a part of it here at the meeting. It has been physically reproduced here. A sort of a virtual exhibition because the people on the stage are present here with their thoughts, with their with their reflections on Don Giussani and it's one of it's one of the insights that we'd like to propose to you today I'd like to give the floor to them now to um, Mother uh, Maria Francesca Righi Abbess of the Cistercian Monastery of Valserena, Professor Joseph Weiler, there's no point in reading his biography because at least we'd have to be, we'd have to, we'd, it would take us half an hour to introduce him with all his titles. No, we're, we're amongst friends here, so it's okay. He's a university professor at NYU Law School and senior fellow at the Center for European Studies at Harvard, amongst other many things. Uh, yesterday he said he came here from Poland and he's also holding lectures in Pol Poland. No, you're, you're receiving lessons. You'll tell us later what you do in Poland. the writer and philosopher Fabrice Hajjaj, who's very well known to, to many of us here. And we have read his books. And finally, Guzman Karikiri. Ambassador of Uruguay to the Holy See and Vice President of the um, of the South American League for in the Vatican. I'd like to give the floor straight away to Francesca. She struck me. Uh, the interview with her came out on the Communal Liberation website with her, an interview with her, and there was something in that interview that struck me and uh, caught my attention in a particular way. I asked uh, Francesca to tell us about uh, Don Giussani, and she uh, had the rare chance to be able to spend a car ride with Don Giussani, and she used this expression in this interview. When he was in the car, he gave uh, peremptory indications to the driver. In the personal dialogue with him, was what emerged was the freedom he had, uh, the, the freedom that emerged and that he gave to the person he spoke to. There might be some photos, if I'm not mistaken, that you would like to share with us. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying that I am very struck and moved by what I am he see here and by the fact that I am here. Because I encountered Christ in 1968 and this 
straight away entailed a following of Christ, a, a following of the words and of the personality of Don Giussani. This space in my life, uh, this moment in my life lasted about 77. It was up to the year 1977, uh, which is the year that I began the monastery. So this was a very short period of time, but it put like the foundations for everything else that happened. I encountered Christ, or rather I opened myself up to his presence through the community of GS in my secondary school where I had been uh, invited. And in school, uh, because in the school that I was in, actually um, my class had expelled me. My class had all of all of the class had been expelled, and so in this school, uh, I realized there was a reality that which was alive with people that prayed and were present in school, in a different way to my old school. My real encounter with Christ and with the adult form of my faith coincided with the encounter with Dandu, with Dandu Sani and with the choice to follow the courses of Introduction to Theology at the Catholic University of Milan. My family, uh, this was a very controversial choice, so I had to um, pay basically this sort of um, price for following such uh, an interest in uh, the, the public university where Marxism was the most prevalent mentality. When I did the only uh, history exam of cr the Christian history exam, I asked to move to philosophy in the Catholic university, hoping that I'd be able to follow Don Giussani. The fact that I was able to find uh, a prayer book, um, I would go to them all the protests, and while all the people uh, cried out, uh, long live Marx, I was very fascinated by this little green prayer book. Then I decided to make a decision. The, the choice was between these protests and the small uh, green book of prayers, and I chose the green book. At the end of the secondary school, I decided to begin studying the course of introduction to theology uh, given by Don Giussani. This, I was, the, the genius of Don Giussani was how the relationship with the mystery was the constitutive factor of his personality beyond all circumstances. And he, the small I was able always to see a relationship with the great you, which uh, made up his personality. Balthazar would have said it with the everything in the fragment, in the fragment. The, Co the book of Coalette says he put a notion of eternity in their heart, but they're not able to understand it. This is the meaning of life in a relationship with another that Don Giussani had understood as the fundamental, as the foundation of the religious sense. Everything is played out within the choice for that presence that made concrete that Christ that I encountered. I didn't encounter him anymore after that course, but I, I continued to literally drink and devour all of his writings. And this was so clear, it was the choice of following him. I tried to remain attached to these words. And it was through these words that I was able to understand in a deep way the tradition of the church. I was, I allowed myself every so often to uh, just 
I expose myself to the things that the the words of the movement and I saw that there is an element of distance. All of this helped me to understand who Christ was. And but all of this began from an action, an act of following, a belonging. And finally in the ultimate risk, which was the step of faith, which only the freedom of the person can accomplish. The experience of a friendship where faith becomes culture. What I was able to experience in Catholic, the Catholic University was the choice of following the paradise of friendship where every step where at every step the promise of hope became true where in the contradiction of the present everything was full of hope where the Christians in Russia were sort of models for us they were a model and that we looked at them with compassion and sadness the so-called anonymous Christians father Scalfi was my a spiritual confessor and when I wasn't able to go and see Giussani I went to him he at that time he used to live in front of the um, he used to live uh, in front of the house of the nuns of uh, the Martinengo street and from both of these I received the word peace the duty of peace as a witness. The time of my university was the time of friendship for me, a, a time of presence of what was happening, of a passionate interest for a tradition in which I was born into. And I had the experience in the Catholic University to see the to be able to understand the philosophy of Saint uh, Thomas Aquinas and Saint Bernard and see how this was connected to my life and then I saw what company Saint Bernard would become for me this was all unifying the, lect the lectures of Don Giussani were like the unifying point of all these courses in, in, in the Catholica University as an, a cultural interest, unifying as an, a friendship which was born there. And there, there was Father Luigi Negri, Massimo Camisasca, uh, Angelo Scala, and we all would go together to meet Don Giussani and if we had questions to ask him or something to uh, a piece of advice um, we lived this as a joyful belonging which coincided with a presence that was significant for society and all of this was important for me uh, I understood, I discovered that Christian faith was the, fun, was the foundations of the two positions that my parents represented, liberalism and Marxism. And in my decision to go to the monastery, surely I decided it was that it, part of my choice was because I didn't want to remain on a level of discussions of controversy uh, because that was not what I was interested what I was interested in but to really go to the depths of the truth of some of what I was discovering and in fact Don Giussani used to tease me when I would come all uh, very annoyed by political questions and he said politics is destroying you and of course it was be through his person that I understood that another political presence uh, which then became a con concrete thing in universe in the monastery it was a way of seeing life as a hypothesis of a work as a verification 
not the verification of someone who is a spectator to see if their experiment works out or not, but the passion of someone who is very true with, with the experience and is convinced by experience. The experience of friendship with the others in this beginning of CL in university was coincided with the experience of an, a paternal authority. And for this reason, uh, and w for this reason, it was very respectful and free. The function, the educational function of this presence came in the form of an accompaniment. Uh, he did not give us any prefabricated res re uh, answers. These were his, the lessons that he would give us. This was his relationship. And I don't remember great speeches on his part. It was a time for decisions, a time for university continue to study, get married, and then I met the monastery which I became a part of. And now in our foundation in Syria, invited us to a friendship with Lauraccioni, a company of many people. We went to Valserena for a study uh, weekend. I said to them that I wanted to go uh, and become a missionary. And then in the end, I became a part of that house. And I had noticed a presence in that house. And then through the wonder of all this, I realized this is what I've been looking for. Nothing, uh, nothing is missing here and this will make my life much fuller. So the monastery is like a place which preserves the, ecolo the ecology of humanity. It was in one of these, it was one, one of these um, travels that I decided I want, I told him I was going to be, become a part of uh, the monastery. Vitor Chiano, and Valserena was the church that I had encountered. The encounter between Father Giussani and Mother Christiana had just happened. And in CL, uh, I also met the let, I got a hold of a letter of a certain Monica, which really struck me. And I remember it by heart, what that letter said. It spoke about conversion. Uh, the passing from uh, ontological loneliness to the freedom to say, I am you who make me. It was the experience of an ultimate loneliness towards the questions that I had within me, but it was also the beautiful and unique experience of a love which was respectful and beautiful. True affection true love has within it eternity or that crumb of eternity which makes everything which makes love true so one day i accompanied him uh, in a car and uh, i used the word um, uh, enclosed monastery he looked at me for two minutes and he said, come to Argentina, there's a beautiful monastery and you are a sort of a missionary type. I was completely in silence and then I said within myself, well, why not? It was 1973 and he had just met this monastery. Uh, my family was completely um, taken aback by this new Christian position that I had taken and now bringing up Argentina seemed like it was really too much. I decided, but I said nothing to my parents. And then in my travels in Tuscany, uh, my travels in Tuscany were justified by a visit um, that uh, I basically had given them an excuse. I said that I was going somewhere that they didn't 
where they couldn't realize I was actually going to Argentina. And I got to the airport and Don Giussani uh, asked me, do your parents know? And I said, no, I, in I m invented another story. And then he said, okay, stay here. It was clear that there was nothing to debate. Then he saw my face and we went off on this trip. Don Giussani, Don Ricci and I in Argentina, not in Brazil, but in a monastery at Hinojo. Um, where I would have found a great a friendship with PG. I'll leave the details of uh, the situation which aren't really central to the topic in question. I was a young girl and I knew that I was going to a mysterious monastery in Argentina. Um, and then I realized that they would have, o they would have only accepted local vocations. And so then I had to knock on the door of the Val Serena Monastery, which was the true first house that I encountered. And then I entered in, seven, in 1977 and I remained there. And since I had been hosted uh, by Don Giussani's indications in a house of the memories before I went in there, and I was grateful for the clear clarity of such a proposal, which made virginity such a visible and livable experience, life as vocation, the authority of a true paternity and maternity. I almost from the, the get-go decide dedicated my life to the monastery from the mo in the monastery to the uh, thanks to the memories and this space of memory of Christ uh, I hoped that it would be, would uh, bring fruit to every everybody. The passing from the I to the the us is like the ultimate maturation of the I. Don Giussani was the ultimate example of the charism which guides a, a hierarchy, a pers charismatic personality who lived the charism that was given to him in an absolute obedience and with the ability to suggest, to indicate in some way, to govern, which is a big word, as a sort of submission to faith. And St. Bernard said the same, an experience and a renewal in fundamental unity with the tradition. Tradition and renewal, and he threw nothing away about what he had in front of himself. The monastery in which he entered, the monastery in which I w entered, the first foundation, the first founding of Vitor Chiano, lived the mo movement of or this post-conciliar renewal with its enthusiasm. Tradition and ex personal experience cons constituted the vital triangle which I found as an expression of the experience of the monastery. I would say that it exalted its greatest potentialities. I came from two traditions that were count contradictory and uh, discovered then Christianity, which was like the foundation of both of them. The Cistercian monastery was like the expression that corresponded me to me the most. I remember the importance that Don Giussani gave to the attention for prayer to the moment of prayer and silence and work, the liturgy as a vital experience of a breath uh, of the experience of the church. I lived what I had heard, a liturgy, the liturgy and personal prayer as a launching point for life. Face to face, which then becomes a hypothesis of work, a sense of being and of his glory, which is a, a ref, reflects through his person. Being a mother and a father, which is exactly what is missing in our society. I am here to testify not the beauty of the monastery, but that I have discovered the 
and saw realized all the promise that I met in the movement there. And it was thanks to the person who indicated Christ to me in the most clearest way and identified Christ as the ultimate and most important point of my life. Thank you, Mother Francesca. Now, Professor Weiler, who hopefully is a bit angry with me because uh, from today, uh, this morning, it's, I, I made him get here early to, to tell some people, uh, to tell uh, a, a, a Rai TV crew a few of his thoughts about the meeting and on Don Giussani. And now it's uh, 9.20 and he's, all, he's still here. And he can show us about friendship. He has a lot to tell us. What a, what a demonstration he is. And Professor Weiler, I introduce him because uh, he, he struck me, he always strikes me quite deeply. And that's that in Don Giussani's message, he found this, this great invitation to, uh, to, come to, to get to grips with uh, the omnipotence of, uh, of the divine power. And he, he met, he says he met a, a Don Giussani who, who, who had a, a universal message that communicated equally to everyone. This invite to, uh, to get to grips, to come to terms with what omnipotence is. So thank you for still being here, Professor. And afterwards is the time you'll tell us a bit about what you've been doing in Poland, but it's not too important. Sorry, I'm still a bit moved by this uh, testimony. Thank you, sister. It's obvious that the world is split in two. Those who had the fortune and the blessing of having met Don Jus in person, to see, to look into his eyes, to hear his voice, to, to see his face and to, to walk part of our journey with him, and the rest of us poor folk who, who didn't have this good luck. However, it's not a, a fatal problem. Why not? And here I'll say something, and please take it with a, with a pinch of salt. Because I draw my inspiration from the evangelists. Because we know for sure that three of them, possibly even all four, uh, on St. John it's unclear, but most of them, if not all, didn't know Christ personally. And they wrote their Gospels based on the testimonies, on the stories of other people, of those who had actually had personal contact with Jesus. And so my understanding of Don Giussani is from hearing people like Mother Francesca, like Caron, like Vita, like Emilia, who, who did have this luck of meeting him. And also to, to study in a, in a deep way Don Giussani's thought and many of his uh, writings. To one of the few who've read from beginning to end the biography of Don Giussani, that's 1,400 pages, it's not a small feat. So if I may, this is my gospel what I tell about Don Giussani, and I should say something, because if we read the Gospel of St. John, and we read the Gospel of St. Mark, we see slightly different versions of Jesus. John's Jesus is different to Mark's. And this ri uh, it, it adds value to our, um, our knowledge of this man. It gives us different points of view onto him. 
and so the the John I'll be present the the Giussani I'll be presenting isn't kind of Don Giussani, it, it's Don Giussani as perceived by Joseph Weiler. It's different to the Giussani how he was perceived by others. And so keeping an eye on the time, uh, I tried to reduce this uh, resounding impression Giussani made on my life in the way that I've tried to explain. I've tried to make it into seven brief propositions, because seven is a holy number. So the first. When we think about, when we meet religious leaders, there's two kinds of uh, different charismas. There's one which is deep. It's cerebral and it's, uh, it's pensive. The hi history is full of these kinds of leaders. And when we, we read their, their writings, we learn important things. Our faith is rich, is made more rich. Contempor contemporary examples are like Ratzinger, or like Ratzinger who, who, whoever hasn't read his second book on Jesus really ought to today. And then there's an orth another kind of charisma, charisma that depends less on the spoken word, but on the voice, on, on the outlook, on presence, on the inspiration this person generates to, to, to see them, to hear them. And it's two different kinds of charisma. There's a small type, but uh, number of religious leaders who are able to bring these two types together. John Paul II, one of them, a great philosopher and also a, a, a magnetic, attractive person. And Don Giussani is part of this small elite group. Because Giussani, even though he, he, he didn't write any systematic theology, he was a, a very profound theological thinker. And at the same time, to hear these, uh, these, these speeches, to, be, to watch his speeches on YouTube, it's, you can tell he's also a magnetic, attractive personality. Why is this important, other than the fact it's uh, an important fact uh, on Giussani, I think? Two reasons. One, sometimes I ask myself, what does it mean when they say a holy person, a person touched by, by holiness? And those who have this combination of these two types of charisma you can say they've been touched by holiness. And secondly, he's a model for the religious man, because the religious man needs to, to search to something in which to, to root his faith, into, into reason, into in, uh, intellectual investigation, into understanding, but, but yet this isn't enough. There needs to be a level of spiritual spontaneity we need to feel the presence of God. And in this sense, Don Giussani was truly a role model. That's my first resonate, the first resonating point that Don Giussani's life made for me. Secondly, we talk a lot about the, the risk of education. How many words we've spent talking about this risk of education that uh, Giussani spoke about. Well, what does it actually mean? Here I'll be a bit tough. If I ask, if I were to ask the question to anyone here in this room, why do you believe in this? Why do you believe that? The answer would probably, if the answer would be, well, because Giussani said so, I can assure myself that that answer, Giussani would not have liked an answer like that. Oh, I believe it because I, I heard him say it and he's an authoritative person. No, he, Giussani believed in thought. I believe because I've heard of, I heard Giussani say it, but I, I reflected, I internalized it, I refused some parts, but it became part of my own autonomous thought in this sense. Giussani is a bit of a Kantian figure in this sense. Something has to come from inside, from, from your own free will, from your own auth autonomy and not from an external authority. For me, this is very important. And there's another thing which I always used to think on the question of the, 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 
the religious, uh, the, the struggle of the risk of education, if we take a his complex personality and try to reduce it to a certain to a single concept. Remember, Jesus' disciples called him Rabbi. Jusani, I would call him. You know, we would call him Jusani the Rabbi. Thirdly, number three. Number three and four are, are connected. The first thing is it's an essential contribution Jusani made to what a person of faith is. That the idea of presence. The idea of an omnipotent God isn't a cerebral idea. It's it's a real presence that needs to be in, in the lives of people. We need to feel him and not only think about him. And, you know, you, you know about this. There's no need to, uh, to elaborate too much on the idea of the presence. You all know about that. Number four is, is connected to this. For the presence isn't... Uh, an, an abstract presence in, in the Eucharist at Mass. Even though it's something beautiful, it's, it's a gift the Catholics have, it, they're, they're blessed in this sense. Pre the presence needs to, needs to happen every day, day by day, not only inside a church. And this is where Don Giussani, he, he fought against the kind of the Sunday Christian a Christian who goes to work on Sunday, but and then goes to work, and no one would know any better. To not be embarrassed in this secular world of being a, a, a religious person, and even this thought of Jusani's struck me deeply, and it had a, a resonating effect with me. These are points three and four. Number five. When I think about my own children, they, they live in a very different world to the one I grew up in. A, with a lot more uncertainty, a lot more risks. When I was young, I, I knew my path, I'll go to school, I'll go to university, I'll work, I'll build my career, and so on. I knew, you know, things have to go well. I knew the path laid out for me. In today's world, think with the, the issue in Ukraine, the economic crisis, it, it, the world is scary. Our, our children are afraid. And Giussani, even before John Paul II wrote, do not be afraid. And this, in, 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 this is fundamental in the world of today. Do not be afraid. That's my point five. Number six. The, uh, the, gen the Spirito Gentile, music. It's not only music, because Giussani, you see him in many great and small things. He underlined the importance of, of beauty in life. Beauty as a spiritual concept, beauty as a religious concept, beauty as, as a way of, of feeling the presence of the omnipotent in, in one's life. This is a, a Christian concept, not a Jewish one, and I learned this from Giussani. How important is it to maintain beauty? A, a small anecdote, in my office every day, there's a, a fresh flower because it represents the presence of beauty, which is free for all to see. This is my number six. And number seven, it won't surprise you really, Giussani loved the Bible. And not as men, and not unlike many of you, you know, unlike most of you, he, he'd actually read the Bible, he knew it. And he wrote some beautiful things, for example, on, on Jacob. It's one of the most fundamental writings, profound writings on Jacob. It, it is written by Giussani, a, a true lover of the Bible. There, I'm done.
Il, prof il professor Fabrice Hajaj ha detto prof Professor Fabrice Hajaj said there's a Dusani has an approach to culture that's that's truly different because it's culture itself that speaks to us about Christ we shouldn't have a, the problem of a of Christianizing culture it already is and this is what makes the dialogue with Leopardi possible for example he added a uh, other writers, French, famous French writers, and this is what consents this, this approach. Culture itself is what speaks to us about Christ, and all this belongs to a, a wider dynamic of revelation. And so with these words, I was very interested to, uh, if, if you could deepen this, this topic for all of us. And thank you for having come to Rimini. I will speak in Italian and also while standing. Two miracles here. What surprises a Frenchman when he discovers the movement of communion and liberation is the central role played by culture. As if artists could be considered prophets in their own right. This astonishment is, is revealing. It shows the extent to which French Catholicism, which in many respects may seem more combative than Italian Catholicism, it nevertheless remains more often than not what I'd call exculturated. And this exculturation that can give its could give it its uh, polemical vigor, its character of resistance to the surrounding world. Since the 1905 law separating church and state, French Catholics have tended to live in a, a separation of religion and of culture. France has splendid cathedrals, but they're a thing of the past. Their faith no longer knows how to bring together the arts of its time. It is content with exercises of devotion or social action. The French Catholic never opens a novel as a Catholic, unless the writer is a professed Catholic. Otherwise, he just opens a detective novel, the latest bestseller, or he just reads to be entertained. He listens to the gospel, but when it comes to going to the cinema, he goes to see a blockbuster of the time. And if he has to promote a book, he would prefer a bad author who can present a baptismal certificate over the great poet whose morals seem dubious to him. The French Catholic is a spiritualist, therefore, and not and a moralist, but not an artist. Something like the Rimini meeting does not exist in France. Someone like Don Giussani does not exist among the French. Certainly in France, people of the church could have invited a, a Tarkovsky, an Ionesque, or an Aaron Appelfeld, but they would have called it dialogue with the world of culture. Proof that culture is another world outside of their own. French Catholics, and I'm talking about the more fervent ones, when they turn to artists, it's by strategy or by spiritual utilitarianism. It's about leading artists to Christ or using art to announce the good news. And in fact, the important thing 
is to save souls, not to produce works of art, because it's the faith that saves, not works of art. Works of art that we can always suspect of leading us to some kind of idolatry. The young seminarian Giussani, as, as he's known, he preferred to go to the chapel to pray with a book of poetry rather than a treatise on ascetism or mysticism. He could have been satisfied with Dante, but no. He took Leopardi, less orthodox. And what of his passion for music? and even secular music. When a Frenchman opens and skims through the CL songbook, he's surprised to discover Edith Piaf and even Fanchon. It's a drinking song that's hardly particularly virtuous. Was Giussani a man of compromise? Did he try and make a, a pact with the world to love creatures too much? How can one not lead? How can one lead spiritual exercises based not on Ignatius of Loyola, but on Cesare Pavese or Thomas Mann? A Frenchman, for example, of the Emmanuel community, who visits the, ho the home of a uh, a member of CL is surprised to not find a, a prayer corner with an icon, a candle, uh, a, a kneeler. Instead of a, a prayer corner, he finds a library. Just as you would in a, a home of a Jew, by the way. It's true that the French, alas, are not the only ones to reserve prayer to one corner and one corner only. Time, there's one set time to pray and a time to worry about work. Is Don Giussani merely opposing this French schizophrenia with a no less questionable confusion? I don't think so. On the contrary, it seems to me that if Don Giussani goes beyond the moralism and spiritual utilitarianism that so frequently afflicts the French, it's because of a, a real metaphysical depth, not a, a worldly concession. I'd like to begin by reading a passage from Si può vivere così. And it was in this passage that I discovered Don Giussani and that I grasped this metaphysical depth I've just mentioned. When I say metaphysical depth, you might think it's something very abstract. It's the opposite. When metaphysics is deep, it reaches the most concrete. It touches on what is found in every being, even the most ordinary. It reveals to us a transcendence that emerges in the most banal things. Here, Don Giussani addresses a boy, a guy who's in love with a girl. This is the, uh, the central plot. The man and the woman and the gift of life that passes through them. It's, it's a primordial story. And this is the question he asks them. My friend, the girl you love, what's she, what's she made of? It's not like she's made of polenta. She's not made of ashes. She's not even made of gold. Think, I love a girl who's, who's made of gold. Oh God, even if she were made of platinum. No, the girl you love is made of another. She's made of Christ. Everything consists in him. The mountains, the body of this girl is made of another because alone she would be nothing, nothing. 
a word. Coincidentally, he, he raises a, a word from, from Paul to the Colossians, chapter 1, verse 17, appears in, in this passage. The word said as if in passing seems to me to be the key to understanding Giussani's thought and understanding his poetic openness to all the diversity of reality. Everything consists in him. You fall in love with a girl. Why are you attracted to her? Where does it come from? You might think it comes from her sex appeal. But behind her sex appeal, in truth, there is Christ's appeal. Because everything consists in him. Without this Christ appeal, sex appeal loses all consistency. The sexual act that you are seeking collapses. Instead of being an opening to the joy of life through communion, through uh, fecundity, it becomes an escape from the anguish of death. Instead of being an encounter with this girl as a person, it becomes a, a dizziness through the friction of mucous membranes and soon emptiness, disgust. Don Giussani goes on to say that in the amorous encounter, it's always Christ who's the great matchmaker. I quote, Who made you find it? The Lord of time, who's the master of time, the Lord of history. Who gives it to you forever? Who assures the eternity of the relationship without which one either does not think about it and is, is a fool, or dies, suffocating. Because as soon as the attraction of a girl is no longer inserted in the attraction of Christ, desire turns to despair. Because only Christ the Saviour can save this desire. Only Christ the Lord can make it a story. A dramatic story, no doubt, of tried and tested fidelity, of daily struggles, of dancing, of mourning, but a beautiful and a strong story, a, a consistent story, and not a moment of enjoyment that leads to a long disgust, a disgust that throws us back towards the next brief enjoyment as well as towards oblivion. For without it, Without him, nothing consists. Thus, Giussani opposes the great metaphysical error, an error that is as much that of atheists as of religious fundamentalists. What is this error? The vision of God and man as two competitors as in competition, the vision of the spirit and the world as two enemies. And one should always take from, the one, from one and to give to the other. And one should necessarily lower the other to raise oneself. Christ says, I am the way, the truth and the life. Then they will say, Christ is the only way, there is no other way, all the rest is deadlock and perdition. But the others will immediately reply, not at all. There are other ways, for example, there is the Route 14 to go from Milan to Rimini. And it is a very concrete highway where your car has just driven. There is also the path that leads Romeo to Juliet's balcony. Isn't that a real path? Giussani answers that the path that leads to Juliet is the path of Christ. The two paths are not in competition. They are not two separate or opposite paths because one exists only through the other. 
If you are really attracted to Juliet, it is Christ who draws you to her. If you really want Juliet, it is Christ you want through her. Wherever there is truth, even if, if it is in the pages of an atheist author, it is the truth of Christ. Wherever there is life, even if it is the life of an ant, it is the life of Christ, because everything in him consists, has consistency. And if you want to celebrate him, you don't have to repeat, Lord, Lord, or Christ, Christ, but sing, Juliet, talk about the ant, name what is good in this atheist author. There's no competition between the Creator and His creature. They are not on the same plane. They cannot come into conflict. One is the cause of the other. And so to love the one is to love the other, and vice versa. You love the poet, then you love his poem. You love his poem, then you love the poet. And God is not only Creator, He is Savior, Loving him as a savior means loving sinners. And God is not only savior, he is Lord. Loving him as Lord means agreeing to be his steward, to act through him and for him, and to gather all the sparks of his light scattered all over the world. what Yusani calls verification or the conformity of the fact with the demands of our heart has is not merely psychological it is always a question of seeing if what we do is really is really what we're doing if what we seek really has consistency if the girl that I'm in love with the Pers the poor person I'm helping, the book I'm reading, I love her, I help, I help them, I read her in Christ, I read the book in Christ as a particular revelation for me of his mystery as the continuation of his story in my life. Don Giussani begins the exercises of 1997 with an ontology which is proof that his starting point is metaphysical. This time, he does not quote the letter to the Colossians, but the first to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 28. God is all in all. Now, this is interesting. He translates the verb in the present tense, whereas in the Greek text the verb refers to a future tense. When all things have been subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to him, to he who subjected all things to him, and God will be all in all. This is another dimension of Danjusani's thought, the eschatological dimension. Eschatology is not a simple thought of the aftermath or the hereafter. It is first of all a teleology, a thought of the finality of all things. Aristotle says that the finality is the cause of causes. To understand what man is, we must look at what he is ultimately made for. But man is not ultimately made for conversion or for morality. Conversion and morality are, if not means, at least intermediate ends. They are not ultimate ends. This point is fundamental to understanding evangelization and the limits of the French spiritualist or utilitarian perspective. which I mentioned at the beginning of my speech. One must convert 
and be converted, certainly. But once converted, what does one do? One must act according to the cardinal virtues very well. But once one has reached perfection, what does one do? The moral or cardinal virtues are only hinged virtues. That's the meaning of the word cardo in Latin, hinge, pivot. They serve to open a door. But once you have opened the door and crossed the threshold, what do you do? Here below, and this is normal, we are interested in the movement that goes from the imperfect to the perfect, from sin to holiness. But we must also be interested in the acts of the perfect. And from here below, manifest something of the acts of the holy and blessed life. Already living what ultimately polarizes all our desire, without which our evangelization will hardly be distinguished from mere clientelism, in which we are happy that there are more Christians, without knowing what essentially, eternally makes the life of the Christian that is the life of Christ, that is the life of life. And this is what lies at the heart of Don Giussani's thought. What is the life that calls us and that already begins here below in grace? What is the activity of the blessed? This activity is not moral perfection, since they are already in God. What is it then? No longer perfection, but creativity. No longer morality, but music. And especially choral singing. We know how important singing is for Don Giussani and in communion and liberation. This importance does not consist only in a presence, but in a precedence. Quotation, five minutes before the first mass of the movement, the song of the movement was born. The beginning of the movement, the beginning of the movement song is the beginning of the movement. There is no difference. The movement is born, so we sing, like a child with his mother. The song appears five minutes before the first. How is this possible? How could the song, how could singing be there before the singers, before the first members of the choir gathered and made their voices heard? What I mentioned earlier allows us to accept the enormity of this statement, the precedence of music over movement. That is, the precedence of music over morality. Music came before because it will definitely come after, because it corresponds to the ultimate attraction, to the call of eternal life. Singing the glory of God in his creatures is the end of all things, the meaning of all things, the aim of all things. And therefore, this end, this aim, is already there in potential as what is at the origin of all the dynamism of existence. This is why Giussani speaks of music as the greatest expression of the human heart and community, and therefore as the element, the atmosphere of every mission. I quote, no expression of human feelings is greater than music. At the beginning of my speech, I said there was no Don Giussani amongst the French. I need to correct myself. There is Paul Claudel. But Paul Claudel did not found a movement. Here is what he wrote 
which seems to me very Jusanian. Don't stop the music. What music? The music of this concert that is human life, where we have no choice but to occupy our place, small or large. We are not cicadas screaming at the top of our lungs, handing, hanging on the bark of a pine tree for the length of a summer day. We have to pay attention to what is going on around us, and much of our destiny depends on the sharpness of our hearing, the quality of our intelligence, and the virtuosity of our reflexes. I remember this sentence. We have to pay attention to what is happening around us because our time is always part of the great dramatic symphony of the eternal for which the Bible and tradition provide us with the key. Without this key, there is a cacophony or a monotonous refrain. This remark leads me to a criticism a criticism that should be made of all disciples who end up betraying their master by dint of fossilizing fidelity. The disciples of St. Thomas Aquinas, instead of being sons of St. Thomas, degenerate into Thomists. They become parrots of the master instead of doing as he did, of thinking, starting from his heritage, by confronting contemporary questions, by taking an interest in the thinkers of their time. Similarly, the danger here is to repeat Don Giussani, as the, uh, Joseph Weiler said, as if the father wished to sterilize his sons and prevent them from having their own adventure, their own children. In fact, to read and reread the religious sense again and again without paying attention to what is happening around us is to lose the religious sense. If Giussani sang so well in the concert of his time with an accuracy that revealed harmonies where others heard only dissonance, it was because he paid attention to God's work, to his past and present inventiveness. In the same way, if we recognize in Father Giussani an example and a father, we must also learn to receive his kick in the backside. That is to say, to turn our backs on him in order to move forward and to recognize Christ wherever he is hiding today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio, for this uh, vast, very dense uh, reading of Don Giussani. There's a, a, an image of the end of the nine from the end of the 90s that became uh, an iconic image for many of us and for many outside of us as well. And that's the image of 
Carichiri accompanying Don Giussani on the 30th of March of the 90s in 1990 in St. Peter's Square next to John, Pope John Paul II. And Professor Carichiri is the man who symbolically and he physically accompanied Don Giussani that day in that brief walk, but he physically uh, and spiritually accompanied Don Giussani for, for many, many years as part of his long experience of service in the church. Thank you for joining us. There are more than 60,000 members of the Fraternity of Communion and Liberation who have more titles than, than I who am not enrolled to bear witness to the life and work of Father Luigi Giussani on the 100th anniversary of his birth. And there are about 1,600 of these writings who, are still, who still have many more titles than I do because the charism that the Holy Spirit and Don Giussani fused has brought uh, the, um, the, a new world convocation of, of total dedication and undivided heart. Did Don Gius not teach us that the experience of this belonging is a precious way to understand the living charism? Are they not really today co-responsible in showing their own lives and what it means to adhere to the charism? I do not dare to dwell or go into the educational genius of Father Giussani, not even into the originality of his remarkable intuitions and theological developments, as others have already done this with so much more knowledge and expertise than I have. And we've heard some important uh, contributions at this meeting. I alone can limit myself to recounting my experience of meeting Don Giussani with this Christian who had such an, extra an extraordinary priest with a, a joyful gratitude in the soul. I remember that when I arrived from Uruguay to work in the Vatican when I was 26, uh, a wise old Monsignor gave me a piece of advice that was very important to me. Follow, he told me, what is recommended in the proto-apostolic book. And it looks at the, it says, look at the faces of the saints and learn from their, uh, their testimony. And I'm surprisingly touched by having served five holy successors of St. Peter. And always looking at their faces and learning from their testimonies. I remember there are good prelates, monsignors, religious and lay leaders in my 48 years of service to the Holy See, but no encounter marked me as deeply as the one with Monsignor Luigi Giussani. These were the times of the eruption onto the, the church scene of these new realities that were called movements and new communities, and which St. John Paul II said should be welcomed and encouraged as a, a response from providence, a response from providence prompted by the Holy Spirit to bring about the true renewal desired by the Second Vatican Council, meeting the need to persuasively communicate the gospel of Christ throughout the world. In the face of the processes of enormous changes taking place, even the crumbling of secular Christianity, often marked by a culture far removed from Christian tradition. How many times did St. John Paul II, in his far-sighted prophecy and attentive paternal attitude, ask us at the Pontifical Council for lay people to welcome them with cordiality, including humbly listening in a spirit of fraternal dialogue to encourage all of their gifts, their fruits of grace, instead of dwelling on their limitations, far from those reactive feelings of suspicion, mistrust, and criticism that characterize a mens ecclesiastica. 
It was his greatest collaborator, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, father of the church, who later became Pope Benedict XVI. He was among the first to appreciate how great uh, signs of life, of hope, blossoming charisms, uh, and what a generation, what a gift for these new generations that were, he wrote, were discovering the joy of the truth and the beauty of being a Christian and bore witness to it. We will do well to, to take up this wonderful homily on occasion of Drusani's birth in heaven. It was at that time in the process of discernment of recognition and fraternity of communion and liberation which I had the, the honor of meeting Don Drusani. The first thing, the first gesture, the living memory that remains of those first encounters was an unexpected and surprising embrace of humanity, such as caring for my life, for my family, for my work. It was as if that encounter, God had touched me and gave me a kind of a, dis in a disproportioned way never to uh, speak to me of the journey to the recognition of the uh, the lay people's conference and ask nothing in return. It seemed that in that encounter, for him, I was, and it, with, with what levels of excess, the most important person in the world. His passion for man was reversed into the most concrete passion for my own person. First was his extraordinary humanity then this anxious awaiting of, uh, of following encounters after the a passionate reading of his writings and listening to his, let's, uh, his lessons in the exercises of the fraternity. Listening to his lessons provoked me and my wife uh, a level of, we were moved, uh, joy, uh, a stupor in emerging from that f emerging from the depth of our heart, as if something that we'd living, something we were needed, was finally emerging. It was like a hurricane that uh, disrupts often a, a level calm. I'd say it was, uh, it was incredible being hit by this presence, with his, his passion, his reverence, with the tone of his voice with which he introduced us to the... The, the, the humanity of the incarnate word with the, the stringent way in which he said what he did with this extreme uh, extreme logic of his, uh, his, his reason, of his thought process. I could think therefore with that vain attempt of uh, you know, my, my, my own sufficiency being a myself a lay adult and under secretary of a department of the Roman Curia that my own uh, Christian skeleton was already strong and consolidated. And instead, I, I was surprised and full of enthusiasm that these, uh, these meetings more clearly illuminated the nature of the, the, the coming of Christianity. It, it made it more reasonable, more beautiful, more attractive in my life. And they educated me to an outlook, a new Christian outlook onto my, my entire personal and social reality. All of a sudden I found myself, I who was meant to, uh, to help the, uh, the superiors of the dicastery to uh, discern their way through this new reality, ultimately led by the Holy Father, as I was recalled to have a, to examine my own conscience, to discern this kind of the Christian fundamentals of my life and my work to let me be provoked by the witnesses of Christian life more full of, um, of evangelism, of, of liberty, of the gift of charity, of, of a, a missionary launching of, of what I was living. And as such, I can affirm that not only did this help me to live better my service to the Holy See, but also that I received much more than what I could hope to give. And together with the encounter with Don Giussani, I, I like to remember that, that I had the gift of meeting the, the sweet and tenacious Chiara Lubic, this kind of prophet of unity, the charity full of tenderness and of the, the late uh, 
of Don Benzi, I rem who's called us to prayer, and the other uh, friends of the community of Sant'Egidio, the, the, the missionary launch uh, in Brazil of the, the Shalom community, and many other things. Occupied and worried, like the figure of Martha in the, in the Bible and the Gospels, often absorbed in a consideration of, of problems, of ecclesiastic situations, I was recalled uh, once again to back to Christ, the ultimate reason to live and to, to work of my humble service to the servant of the server uh, to the servant of the servants of the one God. Don Drusani wrote uh, a letter to the fraternity in which he said that which happened on the 30th of uh, May of 1988 in the encounter with John Paul II in a, a joyful no knowing multitude of, uh, of members in, in St. Peter's Square, his meeting with the Pope was the greatest day in, of, our, of our history. And for me, it was one of the, the greatest days in the, the, the whole story of my 48 years of service in the Holy See. Who cannot remember and repeat the words with which Don Juice concluded his, his talk? The true protagonist of history is the beggar. Christ, the beggar of the heart of man, and the heart of man a beggar to Christ. In accompanying Don Giussani in holding up his arm and climbing the stairs with him that, that led him to, to kneel in front of the successor of St. Peter, I realized with a singular clarity that that co-essentialism of the hierarchical and charismatic gifts which continue to, to build and renew the church in its divine constitution as the the Lumen Gentium, this uh, of the council, reminds us of Christian tradition, that the same Pope indicated that they work together to make the mystery of Christ and his work known in the, for the saving of the world. The Holy Spirit, which speaks through the, uh, through the mouth of Peter, is the same spirit which blows where it likes, uh, lifting up novelties in life in the middle of... Uh, of its new gifts and its new charisms, these different charisms which put themselves at the feet of the successor of Peter to his un, uh, discernment because he is led by the Holy Spirit in the, the unity of the truth of uh, charity, the same spirit that leads us to recognize with gratitude his works as the master of the spirit. It's worth rereading the beautiful document of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in June 2016, Juvenesit Ecclesia. Certainly, it's easier to talk about this co-existentialism co than to actively uh, live it. If, uh, if a, a cardinal like the Canadian Marc Ouellet, pref, uh, prefect of the Congregation of the Bishops, had affirmed in a recent conference that the that pneumatology is once again absent in many processes of uh, ecclesiastical discernment when we miss the outlook to to see the presence of the holy spirit the the concreteness of its gifts the fervor and the freedom which it gives uh, the faithful today in this synodal journey that pope francis has put the whole church on Listening to the Spirit is more important than ever, which is a spirit of unity and of plurality of forms, which and a multitude of forms in the ways it expresses itself in the lives of Christians. Far, far from from you is re reducing these hundred years of the birth of Don Giussani to a simple apology of your founder, in commemor in a nostalgic commemoration of his his absence. Instead, living memory of his presence is what we need. He's present more than ever. He is present more than ever, and he accompanies us in the communion of saints. Without a doubt, when he's, when he's interceding for every one of us through 
when, in, when he faces the Holy Trinity, how much must he be saying to the, to to, to Our Lady, Virgin Mother, son of uh, daughter of your son, please help us so no one may be lost on the journey, as uh, Claudio Chieffo sang in the song Star of the Morning. From heaven, Don Giussani awaits. The, the the faithfulness to the to the charisma he re he received and disseminated, not so we can keep it closed, but to constantly live and renew this uh, this beautiful story of charity, of culture, of missions, through the which we should be proud and grateful. The greatest gift you can give him on this centenary, his one hundredth birthday. I'm sure that he would appreciate it greatly. You can give him your unity. Unity with which we were charged with, with the charge that he was leaded, uh, he was charged with leading the movement. The same unity. Because it's the devil that uh, sows division and opposition. And who we need to anchor ourselves in a more a, a trustworthy and safe journey in faithful obedience to the successor of St. Peter, the ultimate guardian of our charism. For Dundrasani, obedience to ecclesiastic authority and papal primacy was always insurmountable, was indestructible. I remember what uh, Cardinal Scola said, uh, his was, an, uh, was a free obedience. He spoke clearly. He, he kept he kept a relation, a test, a witnessing relationship with ecclesiastical authority, not a political one, an extreme freedom and an amazing humility with which he, he formulated questions, he listened to answers, he raised, he raised objections and he made uh, wise uh, points, but he was always uh, a proponent of courageous solutions. And we shouldn't reduce ourselves to nostalgia in this anniversary, to complaints, to, to small talk, to, to opposition, which these things which Giussani has always hated. No, it's time for, for, propose, for pro, the proposition of, of becoming beggars once again, of a, a humble question of grace in our hearts that, that all of us have a, a surprising amount of effervescent charisma and we need to be aware of, of an enthusiastic belonging, of a, a perseverant education, of a missionary energy to all peoples, which uh, characterizes the original impetus of this movement. Already in 1985, St. John Paul II invited everyone to rise up to the experience that, from which the movement uh, took the reins and re to relaunch the enthusiasm of its origins. And he repeated constantly the invitation of rediscovering the charism which fascinated us and which will convey us to be servants of that, that one power which, uh, which, cre which Christ identified for us. Now, by the grace of God, under the papacy of Pope Francis, it works as a a shock of destabilization and of strong interjections to help us overcome our fatigue and repetition to not content ourselves with what we consider something we've already acquired. To avoid that the, the, the power of the charism becomes a habit. To overcome the, the reoccurring temptation to, to flatten out our dyn the dynamism of a movement within a kind of associative logic, to not limit the expressions of our liberty and of our responsibility in, in crystallized solid forms, and above all, to overcome any reduction of the ecclesiastical bring uh, arrival of the charism and the bringing a, a level of poverty of presence uh, that we, with which we need to uh, look to, at our own lives. 
These are necessary, opportune corrections. Allow me to say that I believe that we are called to, to begin a new phase of our lives, unfolding the, the potential of this of Don Giussani's charism with a new ardor, new creativity, new culture, uh, with a new level of culture and uh, effort to the light of the, um, the pontifical uh, office that, that we need in these times of pandemic, of war, of confusion. We, we need fraternity and a fountain of hope. The same Pope Francis, who from Canada told us, we must return to, to the essentials. We must return to the enthusiasm of the Acts of the Apostles. Return to the beauty of feeling ourselves as instruments of the fecundity of the Spirit today. We must propagate it. This is a favorable time. For as long as this strong and fecund charism given to Don Jus, which, demonst which demonstrates it as a, as, as a useful communal tool, and all the good it's disseminated, including far beyond the visible frontiers of our fraternity, this um, patrimony of the church continues to generate disciple missionaries in whom the testimony of the beauty of the saints is resplendent in your testimony. Thank you. Siamo andati. We we went to we ran a bit over tonight, but but how much have we been able to to enjoy listening hearing people talk like this today in uh, to people talking of Don Giussani tonight in the Rimini it's it my feeling in front of everything we've seen I think I've interpreted a bit more the I think the fact most of you are still here and paying attention tells a lot that that you've enjoyed this as much as I have to hear this this polyphony of different accents uh, accents these different uh, shimmers that I mentioned earlier, this kind of, in this Giussani 100, and I'd like that we join together in a, a hearty applause for those who, who guided us today. In this amazing journey through our hearts, through the heart and through the words and the thoughts of a of Don, Gius of Don Giussani, Fabrice Hajaz, Maria Francesca Righi, Joseph Weiler, and Guzman Carriki. Thank you. Thank you all. I think tonight it is a, a further confirmation of how much we need the meeting to be able to, to hear and live these kind of evenings, these, these opportunities. I remind you all that the meeting needs us as well. And so I, I, I won't beat around the bush. There are signs everywhere around the meeting that say donate now. I thank you all and good night. dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo.
l'aspettavano così? Perché credo in quello che dico. Questo e basta? Sì. Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza e tutti colpiti da una curiosità sospendono un istante d'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il grido.